Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, louder? Um, first of all, those of you who have been bedeviled by uh, my constant harping on the, hard, on the hard problem on Facebook and on Twitter, you have a little break now for 40 minutes. There'll be nobody saying that's not the hard problem, etc. Um, I also want to precede this with a, with a quote that I've also posted on Facebook a few times in the last couple of days because it's relevant to this talk. It's uh, from the historian Hexter, and what he said was, in an academic generation, a little over-addicted to politesse, it may be worth saying that violent destruction is not necessarily worthless and futile. Even though it leaves doubt about the right road to London, it helps if someone rips up no matter how violently, a uh, to London sign on the Dover Cliffs pointing south. So uh, that's, it's going to be a little bit like that. But on the other hand, although I'm going to um, give you an intuition pump for uh, deconstructing uh, hopeful hypotheses about the causal role of consciousness, Although I give you that uh, 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 intuition pump, and although I'll also add, it's not relevant, I'll also add that I personally happen to think that the, that the hard problem is not soluble, but I, I could definitely be wrong on that because I'm fallible like everybody else. I don't want to imply by saying that I think it's insoluble that, it, that it's not important and it doesn't matter. And in fact, uh, that's the reason, uh, among other things, uh, I invited Gary Comstock to give the talk he's going to give, and, uh, and uh, Mart Kiley um, Worthington, and, and several other people who will be, who will be um, talking about the importance of feelings. Because after all, even if we can't say how and why we feel, there is nothing, literally nothing, more important, and this I'm not fallible about, than feeling. If there were no feeling in the universe, all of the things that you're concerned about, whether they're, whether they're family matters or they're ecological matters or they're intellectual matters, wouldn't matter a whit. There wouldn't be anyone for it to matter to, and it wouldn't mean anything. It's feeling that matters, and therefore the question of how and why we feel, which is, very, is a very natural question to ask. After all, feeling is a biological trait, just like all of the others. Uh, um, our capacity to move, our capacity to learn, our capacity to talk, they're all biological traits. The last summer institute was on the evolution of language. It's quite natural to ask, what is the adaptive advantage of consciousness, which I will try to argue is much better and more honestly and naturally and transparently um, treated if you call it feeling and not the thousand other synonyms that we have for it. It's quite natural to ask this biological trait that organisms have, which is the capacity to feel, how do they feel? How, how, do, how, do their, how does their brain, because I'm, of course I'm, I'm, a, I'm a monist like everybody else, how does their brain generate this capacity to feel? And perhaps more important for us, because we're talking about causal explanation here and not just correlation. Why does the brain generate the capacity to feel? What is the causal role that's played by feeling, because on this face of it, and one of the, another habit I have is basically to give my whole talk in a few minutes in the beginning, just in case you fall asleep or whatever. Uh, because, and this is the punchline of the talk, um, Turing's agenda, which is to explain everything that the or organism can do, everything. Once you've explained everything the organism can do, there's no degrees of freedom left for explaining how and why it feels, except under one condition, and I'll describe that condition during my talk, but that condition is certainly false. So there is one satisfactory, acceptable causal explanation. It's dead wrong. So that's, London's not that way for sure. All right, so now that I've given my talk, I'm going to uh, give my talk. Okay, good. And if I forward things, does it work there? Yes, okay. So uh, the talk is about how and why um, explaining the causal role of consciousness is hard. 
this uh, meeting is a centenary, is, is in honor of the centenary of Alan Turing. You've seen two films about him already. By the way, for the people who misunderstood me yesterday, the French film that was shown yesterday was not the English film with French subtitles. It was, in fact, another film made by Michel Serre, an excellent one, in France this year in honor of Turing. And we'll, we'll show it several times at lunchtime, so if you didn't get a chance to see it last time. Ah, je devrais dire ça en français, au fond. Uh, le film, ah bah, si vous ne comprenez pas l'anglais, ça n'a pas de sens parce que vous ne comprenez pas. Okay, so you understood. Me. You understood me that there's a French version and there's also two more, two more English uh, films on Turing. Turing did countless things as the, as the film yesterday and the day before recounted. Among other things, he invented the, um, he invented the computer, he defined what com computation is, uh, he saved us in the war, and in addition, he proposed in 1950, basically, although many people are, it's like Molière, uh, Molière's uh, bourgeois gentilhomme who's speaking prose without even knowing it. Many of you are, in fact, following Turing's research program without realizing that it's Turing's research program. But the Turing's research program is what I just said in a breath a moment ago, which is to explain all the things that organisms, he, he spoke in particular about people, can do and once you've explained what they can do, you've explained how their minds work. According to Turing, you've answered all the questions that you can answer empirically. Dan Dennett would go a little bit further. He'd say, not only have you answered all the questions you can answer empirically, but you've, you've answered all the questions there are. Now, that I strongly dis disagree with, and that's the uh, unanswerable question that I'm going to raise now. For Dan, the very fact that it may be unanswerable means it's not a question. It has no content. And what I'm suggesting is not only does it have content, it has, that is what content is. Without feeling, nothing matters. So if the, if the, if the, if the question how and why we feel is an empty question because we've ex explained everything that we can do, then nothing matters. So that's Turing's uh, program, and the program is doing. Uh, the program is, of course, completed by, by, by uh, it, it didn't start with uh, the, the uh, hard problem and the easy problem, and I'll define them both, didn't start with Turing, in fact, and they didn't start with Descartes either. Poor Descartes has been blamed for the problem, they say, uh, but, but it's not his fault, and moreover, he wasn't the first one to notice it, and, and he's not the last. And by the way, the hard problem, David Chalmers, all he did was rename the problem. The problem's been there all along. There's nothing... There's nothing new in calling it the hard problem. It's, you're, pointing out, you're pointing out that there are many things that people are considering to be answers to the, what eventually turns out to be the hard problem, but that they're not really answers to the hard problem. He calls them easy, but that's, that sounds pejorative. They're no easier than any other problems in science and engineering, and they're unsolved. We don't know how it is that organisms and machines can do everything that more organisms and machines can do. We don't know. But even when we know, once we've answered all those questions, once we have our grand unified theory of doing, the hard problem will still be unanswered. Uh, so Descartes pronounced it, and he also pronounced Well, I, 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 if you ask me about Descartes and his connection, I'll talk about it, but I don't really have enough time to develop his specific contribution. Darwin, of course, is behind the why question. The why question is not a teleological why question. It's an adaptive why question. What is the adaptive advantage? And that's a causal question. What is it that um, the capacity to be con the consciousness, the capacity to feel, confers on an organism that they would lack if they didn't have that capacity? What is the causal role of that capacity? That's what I mean by why. Uh, Turing, of course, is how. He said, if you want to talk about how, um, come up with a causal mechanism. I know that uh, Inman Harvey is going to be disagreeing with me violently. I'm not sure he's going to be quite in a violent a disagreement with the uh, principle, which is just the Turing principle, that in order to explain the mind, you have to explain what the mind can do. And that's what uh, both neuroscience, which we've heard about uh, for, for, for a day and a half now, and robotics, which you'll be hearing about today in artificial intelligence, that's what neuroscience and robotics are trying to, to explain, to explain how it is that causal mechanisms of various kinds can do what they can do. Hebb, of course, is the one who veered the empty behavioristic 
hand-waving about all of this in psychology towards the brain. And so it's really Darwin, Turing, and Hebb and all of neuroscience that we're, that we're um, celebrating uh, along with Turing's centenary. Now, the Turing machine, just to, to remind you, the Turing machine was an extremely simple invention. I think it, was, it, it appeared in both films. It was an idea which captured successfully what it is that mathematicians had intuitively meant by computing. When they, I'm using computing now in its, in its intuitive form. When they, when they do a proof, when they do a calculation, when they solve a problem, what is it that they're always doing? Turing captured it and formalized it in the form of a Turing machine, and he said that it was nothing more nor less than what a Turing machine can do, and his original Turing machine was hypothetical, but then he was involved in Manchester and actually implementing it as a computer. He also went to Princeton and seeded John von Neumann, my compatriot, fellow Hungarian, and John von Neumann, who acknowledges his debt to, to Turing, said we went on to actually build the computer, but of course we built it along the lines that uh, Turing had defined theoretically. And the idea is you have an infinite tape. It has symbols on it for simplification. It could be zeros and ones. You can advance the tape uh, and you can stop. You can, you, can, uh, you can write and you can read. And all of that is determined by the state of the machine. And don't forget that th th it's not magic that decides whether you should read, write, move ahead or, or not. It's the state that the machine is in. But depending on the state, given the state, if it sees, let's say it's in a certain state and it sees a zero, it's disposed to advance the tape by one and write a one. That's an example of the state affecting what it does with the tape, and all it can do is those four simple things. Now, with those four simple things as his idea, he basically proposed to reverse engineer the mind. We reverse, engineers, reverse engineered other organs, the heart, for example. We, we now know the principles of functioning of the heart. We can, we can also build an artificial heart, but there's no point doing a Turing test for the heart because the, the, uh, uh, the heart wears its functioning on its sleeve, so to speak. The heart does what it does. With the human, with the human brain, what does the brain do? It, the brain does everything we do. So it's not as easy to reverse engineering a brain as it is to reverse, engineering a, uh, to reverse engineer a heart where you can see that it's pumping blood and either you're succeeding in pumping it or you're not succeeding in pumping it. If you succeed, then you've, uh, then you've done it. So he proposed to use this, um, this capacity of computation. I left out also the church Turing thesis says that um, basically everything a mathematician does that he calls computation is, can be done by a, computer, by, a, by a Turing machine. And even more so, just about every physical process in the world, just about every physical process, can be simulated computationally. So that's very strong. And every other attempt to define or formalize computation has turned out to be equivalent to a Turing machine. So he had the Turing machine in mind when he said to reverse engineer the mind, but he knew that the mind could do more things than pump, or at least if what it pumps out is behavior, everything that we can do, behavioral capacity, it's what we can do. And so he proposed the Turing test, and the, and the Turing test is, you've heard it described before, never mind the silly way that it was introduced with an imitation brain and a female, with an imitation game and a female and a male and so on. What it is basically about is design, and put the emphasis on what's important, design a, a candidate, a model, that can do everything that the human mind can do. And once it can do everything that the human mind can do, and we're emphasizing doing, and you can't even, so well that you can't even tell it apart from human mind, and let's quickly lay, a, lay to rest another silly thing. The Loebner Prize, the 10-minute Turing test, etc. that's all nonsense. It's not a game in which you try to fool 70% of the 10 judges uh, as to which one's the computer. It's, in fact, an empirical program, designed a hard, a, an easy program according to the hard, easy dichotomy, but hard in terms of the fact that we, never, we haven't gotten anywhere. And as you'll see when you hear... Um, uh, Ioannis's presentation, you'll see that today's robots are very, very f far from, not only uh, from, from, the, from the Turing test, but from what it is that we see every day in the movies robots able to do. Our real robots can't do any of those things. So it's a, it's a, it's a hard problem, but not the hard problem, to pass the Turing test. He said that once you have designed a system that can do all of that, and do it so well that if you, if you it can, it's not an idea, it's not a 10 minute test. The idea is that one of us in this room should be that robot that passes the Turing test. And some of, us, some of us should know that robot for 40 years. That's the Turing test. 
If it can pass that, then, then um, there are no, you have no better grounds for doubting that that candidate has a mind than you have with a real person. Why? Because you can't even tell them apart. And if it's a robot, you can tell if you send it. The reason that he did it in the form of the, the um, teletype or email Turing test is because he didn't want you to be prejudiced by what it looks like. He says, I'm not giving you a theory of what people look like. There are some prettier people or uglier people, bigger people, smaller people. I'm talking about what it is that the mind can do. The mind's in here and the doing's out there. So he chose the teletype version, which was ver words in and words out. It may be that the teletype version is, in fact, strong enough, but not quite for the... Op I think, I also want to repeat that Turing is a genius, and we're pygmies. So whenever I, when I, when I mention anything that sounds like it's critical or that Turing missed this or mis misunderstood that, ignore it. I'm absolutely certain that Turing understood everything, knew and, and intuited everything that was being said today already. So there's nothing to, to uh, correct him on. But he presented his test, nevertheless, in a verbal form. And although he knew that he was presenting the verbal ver version for pedagogical reasons, some people have misunderstood it and thought, well, that's the Turing test. Try to figure out a way of writing a program that uh, processes words in such a way as to be able to fool 80% of the judges in 10 minutes. That's not the Turing test. The Turing test is to actually generate our human verbal understanding and speaking capacity. And it should be testable for as long as you like. You don't really have to test it for very long because after a few days of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of uh, email interactions probably with, some, with, a, with, a, with the Turing test passing program, you will already have a new friend and you'll, and you'll start to stoutly defend them. If you, well, maybe not after a few days, but after 40 years, if you found out, as I said, if you found out that they were created in MIT a year before you started uh, emailing with them, You'd, you'd, you wouldn't say, well, therefore, they don't have a mind, therefore, this has all been an illusion. You'll write back to them. You want to talk about it, obviously. And that's what it means to not be able to tell the candidate apart. It's a lifetime human mind-reading capacity. It's not a 10-minute joke. But, but I do not believe that a purely computational candidate could pass even the verbal version of the, of the Turing test. There are actually three versions of the Turing test. T2 is the verbal one, the one that Turing presented. T3 would be the robotic one. And T4 would be even more exacting because after all, what's doing? Uh, what my body does is what I'm doing, but, but my neurons are doing a lot of things too. They're squirting neurotransmitters. They're, they're sending action potentials. That's also doings. So T4 would be the candidate has to be capable not only of doing everything you can do verbally and everything you can do in a sensory motor sense in, a, in the world, but also if you, if you pull it apart, um, it should be doing the same things uh, inside its head. So the internal doings should be the same as well. I think T4 is too strong. The brain does a lot of stuff that is not essential to uh, having a mind. Uh, what's essential to having a mind is what's essential to being able to do what a mind can do, and that's what our bodies do. It's not squirting, squirting neurotransmitters. But T4 is another level of the Turing hierarchy, and there's some people, many neuroscientists, cleave to T4 as the way to explain it, and not T3 and not T2. I think T3 is the right level of every theory is underdetermined, even T4, uh, even physics. I mean, if once, at the end of the day, when you have a unified theory of everything, it's very possible that there are five unified theories of everything. They all account for all the data, but they're not the same even if they do have the same number of parameters. So, and, and the one you the, say, the only one we have may be the wrong one. So that's called underdetermination, but it's normal underdetermination, right? Um, whereas T2 is, is anything less than a Turing test, just a toy, toy that plays chess, is radically underdetermined. It's ar arbitrary how it plays chess. It could have been playing chess a lot of different ways. It has nothing to do with us. T2 is getting more serious but as I'll show you very briefly, because it could easily sidetrack us, T2, if it were done by a computer alone, by computation alone, is not enough either. And besides, we all know, and Turing knows, that talking and under, that, 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 that teletyping and understanding, uh, sending out words out and words in is not everything we can do. It's very easy to tell apart someone that can do nothing but email from someone that can walk around in the world. Moreover, if someone can do nothing but email, I personally believe you can't talk about anything and everything with them. 
because their their words, their symbols, it's all computation all sim, is all symbol manipulation. Their symbols are not grounded in the meanings. Their words are not grounded in the meanings of of of, of uh, what those words are about. Some words can be <clears throat> learned by words alone. If you know what round is, you know what an apple is. Pardon me. If you know what round is, you know what red is, and I tell you an apple is, a, and you know what a fruit is, and you've never seen an apple, I can tell you an apple is a red round fruit, and you've got an approximate idea of what an apple is. But what if you don't know what red means, and what fruit means, and what round means? Look it up in a dictionary, but what if you don't know what those things, so at some point, you have to break out of this circle of symbols, this Turing circle, and get out into what's equally Turing, the dynamic world of, of sensory motor robotics, and you have to have interactions with the things that the words are about, and a certain number of words at least have to be grounded in the real world. That's T3. T4 goes further than that, and I would say T4 is overdetermined. It, acts, it asks for more before you're willing to say um, it's got a mind than we really ask for. And I have to remind you that before modern neuroscience, we were all busy mind reading without having any idea about neuroanatomy and, and neurochemistry and neuropharmacology. So we didn't use neuro, neuro, neuroscience as our criterion, and, it, and we don't use it now either. What we use our, as our criterion is T3. Um, visually, it looks like this. Uh, T2 is the upper left one. Uh, T3 is the middle one, uh, the Turing test. And T4 would include internal function as well. I'll get back to the t Turing hierarchy later. Now, what is the, mi well, what is the hard problem? The hard problem used to be called the mind-body problem, the mental-physical problem. It's the, it's the problem of squaring. Do you see? No, you don't see. Yes, you see this. Of squaring the, the, the physical stuff, the obviously physical stuff, the dynamical stuff, the doing stuff, with what every one of us, and this is what I didn't discuss Descartes for, what every one of us knows, which is that there's, it feels like something to be a mind, okay? That's, that's spooky spiritual stuff. So it's, 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 it's squaring those two, but that, uh, most of the mind-body problem was sent in the direction of metaphysics. Are there two kinds of stuff? or one kind of stuff. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about stuff or kinds, and we're not talking about metaphysics at all. We're talking about that, that the hard problem is not a metaphysical or ontic problem, where you have to vote on whether you're a monist or dualist. Of course, we're all monists. Um, the problem is epistemic, which is, I know how to explain all this stuff, all the... Uh, all the dynamical stuff, the planets revolving, apples falling, neurons squirting, uh, organisms behaving and uh, organisms behavioral competence. Once Turing's program is over, we'll have the answers to all of those. But in what sense will that explain the fact that organisms feel? How do they feel? Not how do you feel, are you feeling good or bad, but how is it that they can feel at all? And in a sense, even more fundamentally, why do they feel? And that why, as I repeat, is not teleological. It's the title of this of this um, summer school, functional and evolutionary. What is the functional role of the fact that they feel? And what was the adaptive advantage in evolution? Uh, there, by the way, we have a full repertoire of forces, if you want. We have gravity, we have uh, electromagnetism, we have w the weak interaction, the strong interaction. The trouble is, that once you use all of those, and those are all doing, right? These are, uh, this is the world of, I should go back, I should say that, that the easy, the, the, um, the uh, mind-body problem is actually the feeling-doing problem, or the feeling-function problem. That's, that's what's really at issue over there. We have to n replace a bunch of synonyms by what's really at issue. And that's what's hard. The hard part is to account for feeling when this stuff accounts for everything in the Turing program. The Turing program is going to be answered by all of this plus, of course, computation. But the question is, how from stuff like this and computation do you get feeling? Um, feeling, most of us, the intuition that we all have is that the feeling is a force. I mean, I do stuff, the voluntary stuff when I'm awake, because I feel like it. I decide to do it, I will doing it. And the, if you ask me, you know, I, I just raised my finger, why did your, what, what was the cause of your finger, finger rising? I said, there might be a lot of neural neuro, uh, processes going on in my head, but the real cause was I made it go up. I willed it up, okay? That's the intuition we all have, that, that, that feeling is a force. It's actually a force. But as I said, 
all the forces are already accounted for. There's no room for a fifth force here. Uh, generations of parapsychological experiments have failed to find a fifth force. That's when they're doing it up here, right? What I'm suggesting is that from the point of view of causation, the, uh, by the way, the problem isn't action at a distance, but, but from the point of view of, because you have that already in electromagnetism, the problem is that um, when I wheel my finger up, it's as much of a mystery as when Yuri Geller levitates a chair. Yuri Geller can't levitate a chair, so that's, so that's hocus pocus. But my wheeling my finger up is just as much of a mystery. The action isn't a mystery. The feeling that I'm the cause and the feeling of anything is the mystery. The action is easily explained. Sherrington and, and, uh, and uh, subsequent work on voluntary movement, of course, explains from an input-output sense the action. Now, let's lay to rest. I'm going to read them to you because I want you to forget them. All of these synonyms that we keep on um, uh, distracting ourselves from the real problem by saying, oh, well, uh, I'm going to talk about consciousness and not awareness or about qualia, but, but, but and I'm, I'm focused on intentionality. I don't want to talk about feelings. That's nonsense. These are all synonyms for exactly the same thing. And they need to be thrown out because if we keep on uh, doing, uh, rotating around these synonyms, we're just going to keep on begging the question. So what I recommend is, at least for this talk, I've implicitly done it, even though the name of the, the summer school is uh, evolution of consciousness, I've already substituted feeling for consciousness because that's all you need. At the very end of this list, by the way, is where um, the mind, the hard problem has been causing trouble. Because, uh, because you see, if we didn't have the hard problem, a lot of the nonsense that uh, cults and sects foist on us about the, the immortal soul and, and uh, almighty beings, etc., etc., would not be credible because it would be as evident as it is for the other four forces what was going on in our minds. So the hard problem, the mind-body problem, the hard problem, the feeling-function problem is also responsible for a lot of uh, superstition and, and uh, false beliefs about the supernatural. So I propose to call consciousness feeling. And just to remind you that uh, if, you're, if you're tempted to see, yeah, there's feeling, I know what feeling is, but, but, but there are mental states, uh, there, uh, there's internal states. There's no problem with internal states. Remember I showed you the heart. There's stuff that happens inside the heart, look at it. There's stuff that happens in the brain, look at it. The fact that it happens inside your head is not a problem. The fact that it ha happens in inside, quote-unquote, your mind is the problem. Mental states, conscious states, felt states. And what I suggest is the word mental, which I also suggest retiring, the word mental does not mean anything. The mark of the mental is, <laughs> this, the way people trade words, the mark of the mental is supposedly intentionality, which is just another one of these weasel words. What makes a, a, a mental state mental is the fact that it's a felt state. A teapot, a toaster, a um, computer, and all of today's robots that you're going to hear about do not have mental states. They have internal states, no problem with that. They have no mental states because it doesn't feel like anything to be those robots in those states. It's the fact that they're felt that makes them mental and conscious, so why don't we just throw away all those weasel words and stick to the fact that feeling is the target. Uh, and by the way, feeling means a lot of things too. Feeling, it feels like something to touch, obviously, and it feels like something to, uh, to, uh, to be afraid. We know the two usual uses. In French, it's slightly different. Uh, to, uh, feeling is also used for, for smelling. Ça sent, ça sent mauvais, right? That's, that feel, in English, that would be that feels bad. But in fact, it, it's... Uh, it's um, so, so more of the sensor, sensory modalities are already directly covered by the word feeling. I think in Latin, sentio covered even more. But in English, we have seeing. It feels like something to see. Hearing. It feels like something to hear. Smelling. It feels like something to smell. That's all the sensory stuff. Taste, touch. Emotions, of course. It also feels like something to move. It also feels like something to will movement. It feels like something to want. That's obvious. It feels like something to intend. It feels like something to expect, to predict. A little bit more controversial, but I think as rock solid. It feels like something to believe. Philosophers love to talk about beliefs I have that I don't know I have. Those aren't beliefs. That's something going on in my brain. The beliefs I have are the ones that I know I have. Sometimes I forget. Sometimes I can be reminded. And beliefs are things that are happening online. I believe something when I'm in the state of believing it. Otherwise, it's just data in my head and you're begging the question. So belief, 
believing something is something you feel, knowing something you usually don't know, and Descartes will remind you that you probably only know two things, the rest of them you only believe. But at any rate, when you know something, or at least you feel like knowing some, you, you know something, it feels like something to know. It feels something like something to mean um, and to understand. When I speak to you in Hungarian, it feels different because you don't understand what I'm saying. It feels like something to understand. It feels like something also when I'm producing it. So feeling covers all of the cognitive bases. T2, as I told you, is the robotic version. And the reason that the robotic version... Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this because, because... How much time have I got left? 50. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I have to rush. The, the reason... Um, yeah. I'll, I'll just tell it to you as, a, as a, 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 an exercise for the reader. Turing's... Uh, the T2 Turing test, if it were passed by computation alone, would not be would not capture feeling, and you'd have re and you'd have a way of knowing that it hadn't captured ha captured feeling. And it's by Searle's Chinese room argument. If you conducted the T2 in Chinese and Searle <laughs> memorized the algorithm, the computer program, T2 is being passed by computer program alone. Searle could be passing T2 without understanding Chinese. Therefore. And, under, and it feels like something to understand Chinese. It's crucial that it feels like something. Searle couldn't tell you he doesn't understand Chinese. All he could say in English was, I don't understand Chinese. And then when you ask him in Chinese, he'd say, of course I understand Chinese. Are you crazy? Right? So, so if it's all words, there's no way of sorting this out. But if you, um, if you accept his testimony about what he feels, which is, I'm, I'm talking to you in English, and I don't understand a thing, and there's nobody else up there, T2 passed by a computer program alone doesn't work. So you need T3. It's not going into voodoo, you need T3, you need to ground some at least of the symbols that are used in T2 in the robotic capacity to interact with, manipulate, categorize the things that the symbols are about. I, I proposed the Chinese Chinese dictionary as an example of this. If you look up a word in Chinese, it's what, like what I said about Apple before. You look up a word in Chinese, you don't know what it means, you have to look that up, etc. But if you don't have at least some vocabulary grounded in some other way than by verbal symbolic definition, you can't even get started. So you need to ground it. We've done some, I haven't got time to talk about it, but we've done some work on, on uh, dictionaries, real dictionaries, to see if you shrimp, shrink a dictionary down to the smallest number of words out of which you can uh, define all the rest, um, how many are there and what are they? Well, it's a complicated question. There's probably less than 500. The number varies. You have a lot of choice. It's like alternate bases for a vector space. You could use, a, you could use, you could use zero... You could use the unit vectors around zero, but you could also use um, a various in linearly independent vectors, and you could still generate all of the vector space, for those of you who understand that language. But it's the same with language. Um, you don't have to, it's not 500 words in particular, it's about 500 uh, um, initialized words that allows, allows you to define all the rest. And it turns out that those words are also learned younger and probably more concrete. We've also done experiments on categorical perception, how it is that once you learn, when you're, when you're doing the grounding, and now we're talking about the grounding, the sensory motor grounding, when you learn a category, uh, if it's a difficult category, then it changes the way things look. And the way things look, as you recall, is something you feel. So when you're learning a difficult category, if you, if you test subjects on, on how, how they confuse and how well they can discriminate um, the stimuli that they're eventually going to learn to categorize. If you test them before they've learned, you have a certain similarity space. If you test the similarity space after they've learned, you'll find that the members of the same category have become compressed and the ones in different categories have become separated. I, can, I haven't got the time to talk about what the mechanism might be, but it has to do with feature extraction and then ignoring a lot of features and focusing on the features that reliably distinguish the members from the non-members. But the result is a change in the way things look. It feels different. It's the, the rainbow is a more dramatic version of it, but the rainbow is, in fact, uh, colors along a, a continuum of frequencies. It shouldn't be in bands of qualitatively, qualitative qualia, again, qualitatively different colors, but, in fact, it is. Now, the paradox of all this is that psychophysics, which is the one that tells us that you know, people can discriminate uh, uh, differences of equal physical size that cross the, the yellow-red boundary 
uh, more, more readily than the, than the same size difference within the red or yellow range. That's psychophysics, but that's all behavior. You know, you show a, you show a wavelength, the subject says same or different, and then you map out the, the space and you say, aha, uh, some things are compressed. It has nothing to do with the fact that all of that feels like something, right? Psychophysics doesn't penetrate into feelings either. It just, it's all doings. Discriminating is all doings. So even our work on grounding and on categorical perception is only the easy stuff. It's about doing. The fact that things look different rather than make you treat them differently, discriminating is something you do, right? So if something becomes more discriminable to talk a non, um, non-mental language, if some things become more discriminable, they're more discriminable. Darwin needs that. Some things have to be more discriminable for, for the sake of survival and reproduction. But why do they have to feel different? Why do they feel different? The, the, I'm almost closing. The, the, uh, the hard problem is an explanatory gap. Normally, when you have an explanation with a mechanism, you say, these are the parts of the mechanism, whether it's this kind or this kind or this kind. If I take this out, and this is what neuroscientists are doing, you can't do this anymore, so that's the causal role this is playing and that's playing, etc. And that's fine for doings. That includes, by the way, your famous insula and amygdala, because, because if you take out the amygdala, there's lots of things you can't do anymore. You can't do it. And, and for psychophysics, if I took out the color um, discriminating capacity, then, then you wouldn't be able to discriminate colors. But that's all just doing, right? It's correlated with feeling, and, and for clinical purposes and for everyday purposes, the correlations are enough. But for explanatory purposes, it's just as reasonable to say as it is over here where I say, what would, what, would this, what, what would happen if I took out this widget to say, what would happen if I took out the feeling widget? What could you not do without, with feeling that you could do with... Uh, what, you could, what could you not do with feeling that you could only do with it? Think back to the four fundamental forces, though. The trouble is that if you subtract everything that there is to subtract in those terms, you've not touched feeling. So we're stuck with the problem of function and evolution, how and why. These are our leaders, and we owe it to Alan Torrey. Thank you very much. Thank you.